The topic then is mathematics and ontology. I'm, I'm Nick Nesbitt, and uh, our three speakers are, are, are going to be Tzu Chen To, and Oliver Feltham, and then Jana Barankova, who will be back in a second. Uh, and so let's start with Tzu Chen, who uh, teaches at Bristol in the UK, and uh, he works on themes in early modern metaphysics, physics, and mathematical method, and issues in mathematical objectivity in the 17th and 20th centuries. He's recently published a monograph on Leibniz's dynamics, Wies Wim, uh, Wim uh, declin declinations of force in Leibniz's dynamics. And uh, the title of his talk today is Sets, Structures, and Sizes, Mathematical Ontology Revisited. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to say that I, the, um, returning to working on Badiou's Mathematical Ontology after some years of hiatus, primarily working on my, my book that was just mentioned on Leibniz, and um, there are many things that I'm putting on the table that haven't been fully or adequately digested by me, but I hope I can point to a few interesting uh, things in here uh, and topics for discussion and for work to continue. Um, so the aim of the presentation is to underline some imminent problems within the project of mathematical ontology opened up by Badiou in his ongoing Lettres et Vlenement series, currently in anticipation of the third volume. Many of the key issues will be addressed in other papers in this conference, so I would just like to reconsider problems of the positive results of the project of mathematical ontology in light of the reconsideration of set theory itself. The main issue concerns the multivalent role played by the, by the concept of the infinite within this project. In particular, my work concerns the relation between the infinite and the valence of the inconsistent multiple uh, within the project. So the, 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 the key insights of Badi's mathematical ontology engages in set theory are, are twin. So there are two sort of basic places where this grows out of. The first concerns the role of the void and its count in sorting the distinction between consistent multiplicity sets, the hierarchy of sets, and inconsistent multiplicity, the void that is foreclosed somehow behind the sign of the void. So that's, that's the one, uh, one key point. This is what Badiou calls the first ontological seal. Um, and the second is the establishment of an actual infinite. And this is identified through a rejection of the traditional forms of, de of determining or even understanding uh, the very concept of the infinite. So we heard this morning uh, that Monsieur Cartier does not accept the infinite. Well, but infinite in what sense, right? How, how, which definition of the infinite is rejected or accepted, right? So these are always uh, questions. So, so within the development of Cantor Cantorian power, so the means by which we measure set size, um, transfinite induction allows us to build a set theoretic hierarchy of sets that supersede the traditional countable infinite or the completed indefinite, to put it in other words. Yet to what degree is this related to the inconsistent multiplicity barred by the void and the relation to the sets belonging? So there, there, there is a, uh, uh, I would say, a debate within people who are interested in Baju to understand the relationship between this being as such that is somehow named the inconsistent multiplicity because of the count of the void, and how is it identified with the rest of this infinite outgrowth, this accretion of transfinite um, quantities and, and, um, and um, sizes? And what exactly is that relationship? Is, for example, in some places you can recognize that the inconsistent multiplicity is something that's functioning like um, like the continuum, right? So it's this thing that is, um, um, the, this thing that is, you have a hard time trying to decide exactly at what, at what, uh, at what size this continuum is actually counted, right? Um, in, other, in other cases, it is simply this indefinite growth of transfinite uh, sizes. So, 
so those are some questions. These questions, um, so, um, so, and, and more importantly, how is this, these questions related to the inconstructible sets that indicate the existence of truth in Badiou's formulation? Recall that the, the important connection between uh, this, this problem in this outgrowth of the uh, set theoretical tree is that you have a hard time, you, you, you have uh, the existence of non-constructible sets which measure larger than the countable uh, sets. So, so what is the relationship between these inconstructible sets and the existence of truth in Badiou's own formulation? These questions lie on mathematical grounds that are constantly shifting also. So in these cases, the transformation of mathematical knowledge shifts the ground on which we understand being as such, the subject, the existence of truth. In this presentation, I'll just examine the difficult relation between the subtracted one and the inconsistent multiple. And I'll look at two different cases. First, I'll examine the case of Cantor's own conception of set as a one totality, somehow a kind of set of all sets. And second, I'll examine the persistence of the part-whole relationship uh, as an abiding factor for understanding set sizes. So I will draw some conclusions with the aim of identifying the open project of mathematical ontology. So another way to, to see this is one task, one enormous task, is to understand what Badiou has done and, and said. Another task, I think, is he leaves open a project that we, can all, we, we should all participate in, which is to say the continuation of a kind of mathematical ontology and the, the ability to evaluate and analyze positive results that we can get from this project. And so it's, on the one hand, it's, it's hard to get exactly a means to evaluate it. So it's, sometimes in interpreting Badiou, you just accept it or you don't, right? But trying to get a methodology to try to how to evaluate the positive results is, I think, an important um, next step. So in order to start, I would just want to clear the ground. Um, so just to repeat very quickly, um, the original point of connection between set theory and ontology is the count as one of the void. So this is what Badiou calls the first ontological seal and distinguishes the inconsistent multiple from the counted or measured sets. So in this, the inconsistent multiple is that which is behind or beyond the one without one, but this only appears because of the count of the void, right? You don't have the inconsistent multiple without the count, without the, without the counting, right? So what is key here is that uh, that there is no inconsistent multiple uh, without the count S1, which distinguishes it from the aggregation of structured sets. Inconsistent multiplicity then inexists, so this, uh, entre guillemets, um, in, in quotes, before the count. The underli this underlies the notion that ontology commences without a pre-given object. Um, and since the count of the void is not the count of some pre-given object, from a constructive, so, from a constructive perspective, this count through the resources of the set theory delivers a wealth of structures starting from the relation of belonging and the successor function. And uh, with the set theoretical axioms, we build up a hierarchy of sets that ranges beyond the usual counting numbers, moving from transfinite order to transfinite orders. Um, so this deliverance of structures allows us to speak of the multiple without the needed reference to, to some kind of or unity at as traditional theories required. So we can also then also maybe refer this back to this um, famous Badiou-Miller debate in the Cahier pour l'analyse for versions of the attempt to reintroduce some kind of or unity, even in a dialectical manner, of what Miller called suture. suture. Um, so the key aim, aim of uh, Etre l'événement is not to only establish the connection between sets and the objectless mediation of being qua being. So it is also to identify the realm of entities that escape the count, so to speak. Beyond the countable infinites and the larger and larger set sizes are also inconstructible sets um, that cannot appear within the hierarchy properly. These sets represent the existence of truth beyond the crescendo of constructible sets. As such, the problem of mathematical ontology is the dynamic interplay between what exists and what is presentable and what exists and not presentable in the constructible universe of ZFC, uh, zermelo frankel uh, set theory with choice. So if there is an evaluation of this ontology, it comes down to the mechanism of the presentation that allows for this dynamic to function. So it comes down to the localization of inconsistent multiplicity within set theory. So 
Um, so here our, our, pro our pr troubles begin. Um, if I was a bit more diligent, I would have also quoted in French, but I didn't. Um, so let's begin with a quote from the middle of being at events. Uh, what, however, is an infinite multiplicity? In a certain sense, the question has not yet been entirely dealt with today. Moreover, it is the perfect example of an intrinsically ontological mathematical question. There is no infra-mathematical concept of infinity, only vague images of the very large. Consequently, not only is it necessary to affirm that being is infinite, but that it alone is, or rather, that infinite is predicable, predicate, which is solely appropriate to being qua being. A few lines down, it is on the contrary of being as such and of it alone that infinity is from this point on predicated in the form of the notion of an infinite set. And it is that finite which serves to think the empirical and intrasituational difference that concerns beings. So here you kind of see that after Badiou has dealt with this problem of counting the void and the uh, what is not a being is not a being stuff in the beginning of the being an event, uh, he actually, you can retell the entire story from the perspective of the infinite, right? Um, so one thing to point out immediately is that a mathematization of concrete situation does not require the infinite, right? So, you know, we often read in commentaries on being a, an event uh, that, uh, yeah, it's very well that it works, but what about concrete situations? Well, he tells you. It's just, the, it's just, we just use the finite. There's no problem. You don't actually even need set theory for this. Um, <laughs> and so the infinite stands in an ambiguous relationship between philosophy and mathematics since the concept is neither given nor fixed by mathematics. So this is the, um, the unique aspect of the infinite here and the role that it plays within being an event. In the same passage that Badiou, of this here, Badiou notes that, quote, it is only in mathematics that one finds an univocal conceptualization of the infinite. That is because this concept is only suitable to what mathematics is concerned with, which is being qua being. So what is privileged in mathematics is this ability to provide a univocal formalization, univocal discourse on the infinite. It is not the source of the concept of the infinite, right? Nor the final place of adjudication. So as such, philosophy might be understood as a repository for the things in the infinite that resists um, its transparent formalization. So we can understand it in its dialectical or equivocal aspect from a philosophical perspective. But it intersects mathematics in so far as it established univocity. And this univocity, as we actually heard in this, this morning twice, is a historically conditioned one. Right, so, you know, in a, you know Euclid is no less clear or obscure because of set theory. Right? But it is historically conditioned by the mathematics of its time. So in this process, a mixed and an often opaque one, one needs to evaluate the valence of mathematical ontology that emerges. So an abiding recalcitrance of the infinite constitutes the engine of mathematical ontology. So uh, I'm trying to see how much time I have. Yeah, OK, good. How is uh, ontology set theory localized then uh, localized within, sorry, how is inconsistent multiplicity localized in set theory? Cantor's position concerning, concerning set was something that was rejected from its later canonical version, or the zermelo frankel axiomatic set theory. The issue that concerns the problem is the definition of a set, menge. In basic terms, this concerns the very passage from what is understood as the naive set theory of Cantor uh, and the axiomatic set theory introduced later by Zamello and reworked by Frankel. The Cantorians, uh, the, in Cantor's contribution to the founding of the theory of transfinite numbers, Cantor defines an aggregate, a menge, as a collection of the whole, zusammenfassung zu einem ganzen, M, of definite and separate objects, M, small m, intuitions of our thought. So we can compare this to the contemporaneous work of Dedekind, who also provide a version of this naive set theory through the concept of system, which is an aggregate, a manifold, a totality of things, which are in turn, quote, every object of our thought. Um, that's Dedekind. Um, in the development of set theory after Cantor and Dedekind, these appeals to in intuition, thought, or objects of thought encountered immediate li limits. One of these limits, 
which is the central outcome of this appeal to intuition, was immediately obvious to Cantor, who would eventually become, uh, which, and would eventually become a defining issue for the axiomatization projects. In his famous letter to Dedekind of 1899, the question that Cantor asked himself concerned the sort of multiplicity that would constitute a set in its rigorous sense. So could there, for instance, be a set of all ordinal numbers? Predating Russell's paradox by two years and echoing Borali Forti's paradox a few years before, Cantor recognized that such a set would be contradictory in the very notion of the ordering of the set of sizes, cardinality, the cornerstone of the concept of the transfinite. So simply put, if there was a set of all numbers, and if this were indeed a set, there would be a number omega greater than the number that measures the set. Thus, the number would have to belong to this original set since it is the set of all numbers. So this sounds a lot like the Russell paradox. As such, um, omega would be, or sorry, delta would be greater than delta, which is a contradiction. In a mathematical sense, we could say that this is the set of all numbers is too large to be measured, even with the transfinite numbers, which of course themselves numbers. The problem recalls the traditional paradoxes of the infinite, um, and as Russell will later show, the problem will be pinpointed to the no notion of the naive, intentional notion of sets. The intentional reference to sets by means of property or objects of thought falters precisely because there is an intentional object set of sets, which is contradictory. The appeal to intuition in the definition of sets thus can be replaced with a minimalist one. So in zermelo frankel set theory, this is constituted by the relation of belonging and in contemporary terms, a set is simply defined by all the elements that belong to it, which are themselves sets, rather than having any kind of intentional um, uh, predicate. So in the same letter, Cantor aimed to circumvent the contradiction by underlying the exclusive conditions of the, his original definition of sets. So Cantor insisted that the set must be consistent, underlined by his idea of the definite and separate in his original definition. This illustrates the fact that the problem is not a paradox, but in the problem of the inconsistent set of all sets in Russell or the number of all numbers in Cantor constitute an inconsistency that should lead us back to the problems in the premises of, this, of set definition. So in Badu's own treatment of the issue, he cites Cantor in full. So this is the first part. So on the one hand, a multiplicity may be such that the affirmation according to which all of its elements are together, zusammenseins, alle ihre Elemente, leads to a contradiction such that it is impossible to conceive of the multiplicity as a unity or a finite thing. This multiplicity, I name them absolutely infinite multiplicity or inconsistent. Eine inconsistent, eine absolut unendlich vielheit. Um, and, you know, there's a kind of interesting ambiguity, like semantic ambiguity between unfinished and infinite in German, right? Because unendlich. Um, also, it's also something that Hegel, um, a word play that Hegel uh, engages in. So this tricky passage concerns a number of different problems, and the, one of the issues is an issue of translation. So in the new standard translation by um, Bauer, Mengelberg, and Heinort, the same problematic is translated as, for a multiplicity can be such that the assumption of all its elements together lead to a contradiction, so that it is impossible to conceive of multiplicity as unity, as a finished thing. So, ein fertiges Ding. And that um, adds a, a, a new dimension, perhaps, to understanding the relationship between inconsistency and the infinite. So this translation, I think, correctly renders the fact that Cantor was not speaking about the finitude of transfinite sets, which would be an odd thing, <laughs> um, but rather the consistency of certain transfinite sets. This distinction being between the consistent and inconsistent multiplicity, the first being sets and the later being absolute infinite multiplicity, played a central role in the formulation formalization of set theory for decades to come. So the definition of set through the conceptual dependence on a loosely internet, it, it, sorry, intuitional notion of unity or one finished thing, I'm Ferdigus thing, ding, uh, places unity before multiplicity and renders the set dependent on the objects defined by their properties and constituted by intu intuition. So Badu affirms that the axiomatic projects in set theory and the virtue of not relying on this Cantorian uh, appeal to intuition. So uh, 
but you, I cite him, yet the one and the multiple do not form a uni unity of contraries, since the first is not, whilst the second is the very form of the presentation of being. Axiomatization is required such that the multiple, left to the implicitness of its counting rule, must be, uh, be delivered without concept, that is, without implying the being of the one. And further, he argues, in Zermelo and Frankel's stabilized elaboration, there is no other non-defined primitive term or value, no er elementa, uh, possible for the variables apart from the sets. Hence, every element is of a set is itself a set. This accomplishes the idea that every multiple is a multiple of multiples, with no, references, with no reference to units of any kind. So, as Badu is well aware, ZF set theory is not a Cantorian one or rather it's a post-Cantorian one, um, and is rather one that eschews Cantor's original definition of the concept of the set, a theory of sets that rejects the definition provided by, by Cantor. So, uh, so Badu's mathematical ontology depends on the maturation of set theory from this intuitional or naive background to its axiomatic formalization. As we remarked earlier, it is the axiomatic development of set theory that is precisely what provides Badu with the fundamental connection between ontology and mathematics. So the two aspects that I mentioned before. So these two aspects of uh, axiomatic set theory explicitly distance themselves from Cantor's naive conception and, uh, yeah, agri and, and uh, to, uh, right, naive, a conception of sets built on an appeal to intuition. So it is this distance that constitutes the ground of Badiou's ontology on, on the question of sets. So as he says, um, uh, oh wait, sorry. Um, there's no question about it. The first present multiplicity without concept has to be the multiple of nothing because it, is, it was the multiple of something that something would be in the position of the one. And it is necessary thereafter that the axiomatic rule authorize compositions on the basis of this multiple of nothing. So I emphasize here that this observation is made precisely on the basis of a distance from naive set theory and in turn philosophically qualifies the multiple of nothing as the basis of um, mathematical ontology, but use mathematical ontology. To constitute the grounds of an imminent multiplicity constituted by the void, the nothing of the rejection of metaph metaphysics thought through the conceptual power of set theory, we should recognize the historical transformation that Cantor himself constitutes. And as Badiou argues here, uh, one could argue that Cantor, in brilliant anticipation, saw the absolute point of being of the multiple is not its consistency, thus its dependence upon a structure of the count as one, but its inconsistency, a multiple deployment that no unity gathers together. So, so we can put our emphasis here on the second, you know, you have the first force, which is the counting of the one, the, the, the one that builds up the hierarchy. On the second, on the other hand, you have the, the, the sort of unruly intrusion of the infinite to actually uh, be engaged within this process, this, unruly, uh, this um, inconsistency, right, that no unity can gather together. That, that's great. So, um, so as, as Badiou explains, this provides the non-being or the point of impossibility that is the context within which wherein ontology achieves its ground for articulating the difference between being as such and beings. So from a strictly mathematical perspective, Cantor's treatment of the definition of a set was something to be overcome insofar as it led to the inconsistency and unrigorous distinction. But for Badiou, it is not simply the correct mathematical solution or the exclusion of the paradoxical set that eventually cleaned up that is eventually cleaned up in axiomatic set theory that illuminates the establishment of mathematical ontology. As a concrete instance mirroring the overcoming of the metaphysical priority of the one and the total, it is precisely this entanglement between consistent and inconsistent multiplicity in Cantor's last-ditch metaphysical theological supplement that situates the limits of mathematical ontology within the horizon of Cantor's inconsistent multiple, um, or absolutely multiple. So no doubt if we consider the ontological separation from philosophy as a condition of ontology, um, as a mathematical discourse enclosed within the limits of set theory, this cutting of the Gordian knot um, uh, would present itself without its external dialectical constraints, philosophical constraints, let's say. On the other hand, however, the arrival at this very subtraction of the one totality through ontology as mathematics places the transformation of thought of multiplicity within a historical passage 
formally, for, formulated retroactively and reflexively through Cantor himself, and perhaps a move that reaches as far back, back as Plato's treatment of the multiple in the Parmenides. In Badiou's own treatment of Cantor, this dialectical conflict can be localized at the point of the difficulty that Cantor faced in his own definition of set. However, it is this very separation that places ontology within a concrete and historical situation that not only renders the grounds for mathematical ontology coherent, but also underlines ontology's consistent treatment of the inconsistent multiple. Um, and this renders ontological discourse itself undialectical. So in this series of localizations, the localization of consistent multiples within the inconsistent absolute multiples, the localization of axiomatic set theory within the historicity of its grounds, we gather a more precise picture of the imminent challenge of mathematical ontology. The structure provided by the axioms produces an imminence wherein the identification between mathematics and ontology can be established. This imminence, however, provides the very means of outlining the historical understanding of how consistent multiples within set theory relate with beings inconsistent multiplicity. So um, as mathematical ontology localizes inconsistent multiplicity, the point of impossibility encountered in Cantor's work through the subsequent developments, developments in set theory, uh, including the struggle with the independence proof, proofs, um, unfold the undecidable nature of inconsistent multiplicity. It is, however, equally true that the historical twist concerning inconsistent, inconsistent multiplicity localizes axiomatic set theory. So it is in this light that, as Badiou aims to establish in being an event, quote, mathematics is the historicity of the discourse of being qua being. I always had a very difficult time understanding that, that sentence. I'm I hope I've given a, a good interpretation of it. But, um, so, right, so there is, how much time, more time do I have? 15? Perfect. So there's another part of this. Uh, so the one, on the one hand, I've sort of taken a quick, quick look at the de definition of, of the, the problems with the definition of set and totality and uh, the consequences of the, the um, subtraction of the one. But there's another one that exists within set theory, uh, within a very intuitive approach to mathematics. And this is the one of um, the parts and the whole, right? And if you, I'm just gonna give a very quick summary of this. Um, so the part and the whole was one of the classical problems which refused pre-Cantorian pre mathematicians access to a kind of definite infinity. Right, because if you have all the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, and you take all their squares, obviously the square numbers, one, four, nine, 16, 25, belong to um, the naturals in some way. They ap appear later in the sequence, no? And so you can say, if you take all, all of this, that there, there should be a kind of distribution of their parts within the natural numbers, right? So famously, Galileo really, um, characterize what is at stake in this. And for better or for worse, this is the formulation that gets taken up by everyone uh, until Dedekind, right? So Saviati in, the, in Galileo's uh, dialogues concerning two new sciences basically runs through this, ex this example, right? That all the parts of the natural numbers correspond to one-to-one. Uh, -to -one to the, the series of natural numbers. And so and Salviati says, so far as I can see, we can only infer the totality of all numbers is infinite, that the number of squares is infinite, and the number of the roots is infinite, neither the number of the squares less than the totality of all numbers, nor the latter greater than the former. And finally, that the attributes equal, greater, and less are not applicable to the infinite, but only to finite quantities. So if you want to play the game of you know, how many parts uh, how many odd numbers are in uh, the series of numbers up to 10? Well, it's precisely half of them, right? How many even numbers is also half of them? Um, uh, you have to play that game only with finite numbers, right? So, and it turns out that this is the very definition, right? Rejecting, right, accepting Galileo uh, Salviati's claim that equal, greater, and less are not applicable to the infinite becomes the very definition of the infinite in Dedekind. So in Dedekind's Fasin, Vasolen, Dizalen, he says a system S is 
said to be infinite when it's similar to a proper part of itself. So we'll replace system here with sets, essentially, naive sets, uh, Dedekind called systems. Uh, and in the contrary case, S is said to be the finite system. So he defines the infinite as precisely that which is equinumerous as its proper part, and then whatever isn't that is finite, right? It's one of the most beautiful definitions, I think, in, in the history of philosophy. So, so later on, he, he gives an example of this. So my own realm of thoughts, the totality S of things, which can be the objects of my thought, is infinite. For S, if S signifies an element of S, then the thought S prime, which is the thought of that thought, um, is also an element of S. So it's infinite, right? Because the proper part is equal numerous to the, the original. Uh, set, right? So this is more or less canon un until recently, right? Uh, of course, mathematicians are very smart, and so they're always trying to mess with the rules. Um, but people who want to sort of maintain the part whole relations, they're unhappy with this definition of the infinite, um, have always existed, right? So Robert Grosseteste, um, so I'm, I'm using, I'm relying heavily on Mancosu's um, Mancosu's work on this problem recently, uh, Paolo, Paolo Mancosu. Right? He, uh, so, so he, one of the clearest uh, examples of people who really want to maintain the part-hold relationship, even for the infinite, is uh, Robert Grosseteste, who is also, you know, a great mathematician in his own right. Uh, it is possible, however, that an infinite collection of number is related to an infinite collection in every proportion numerical and non-numerical, and, and some infinities are larger than other infinities, and some smaller. So you have, you have this. So thus the collection of all numbers, both even and odd, is finite. It is at the same time greater than the collection of all the even numbers, although it is likewise infinite, for it exceeds by the collection of all the odd numbers. So in recent years, in the last 20 years or so, there is a development of um, a way of building part-whole relations back into ZFC. Um, and this theory has gone through several, had several stages, but the most mature and the most uh, recent ones is developed by uh, Italian mathematicians, uh, Benci, Di Nasso, and Forti. And they basically want to create a system, an arithmetic system that satisfies the three properties. So the first is bijection. This is sort of co what it has in common with uh, set theory, um, and but they want to preserve in two. They want to have a system where strict belonging means means that it is it has a smaller measure, right? So it's a it's a situation where the part whole relation where the part is smaller than the whole uh, uh, holds, right? And then you also have some nice uh, algebraic things that you you can do with Cartesian products and disjoint unions. Um, so I'm not going to walk through all of it, otherwise the talk will just be on numerosity theory. But basically, with uh, uh, several definitions, including a, um, a labeling function for sets, they are, he's able to establish a way to build part and whole through these uh, nice Cartesian, uh, sorry, nice uh, algebraic uh, operators. Um, so you need to label the sets first, and then you establish uh, some isomorph some relations between the label sets up to isomorphism, so that it will resemble set theory. And then, uh, then you define um, different kinds of products. Um, and then, the key thing is uh, this definition of numerosity. So. So it is not strictly on the same level as ZFC because we are dealing with uh, classes. So a numerosity function for the class L of all countable sets is a map from L to N um, for where N is linearly ordered. So that way you can, you can sort of extend ZFC just a little bit and get the part whole relationship. Um, it's not what the intenders, the, 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 not what the founders intended, but it is uh, doable. So without getting into all the details here, um, it's a very alluring feature of a new developments in set theory that you can have uh, some of the old canonical cornerstones of set theory changed. Um, and so the question becomes, 
Well, the, 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 the issue is, is concerning the sort of shifting grounds of mathematics and also the shifting ground of how set theory is even to be interpreted, right? Um, and of course, Benchy, Danasso, and Forti aren't doing this just for fun, right? They, I mean, they, they want to develop numerosity theory in order to challenge standard interpretation of uh, the way set sizes are used to determine the truth of the general con continuum hypothesis. So it, there, there are larger goals here, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I will go back to this issue of infinite multiplicity, right? So, and just reaffirm the fact that for, for what we're looking at, there is no infra-mathematical concept of infinity, only vague images of the very large. And I would say, I would just draw two implications and close, right? The localization of multiple, of the multiple within inconsistent multiplicity problematically places the continuum as a kind of surrogate concept of the inconsistent multiplicity insofar as it stands behind the work of measurement uh, concepts produced within set theory. The main engagement of set theory uh, within the, within Etre l'Aimement is based on a classic ZFC structures that emerged from the Cantorian revolution, a hierarchy of sets. The positive argument is that the subtraction of the one ontology does not fall into chaos, but is rather determined by a world of transfinite orderings. The infinite is roughly schematized here as the transfinite orders qua actual infinite infinities or infinities beyond the countables. However, the bridge between the potential to the actual infinite is only evaluated either by weakening the concept of measurement, or like the weakening of the part whole principle, for example, or with respect to the continuum. If the first criterion can be overcome, then the continuum can be counted in increasingly different ways. This is positively indicated by numerosity theory, but also negatively suggested by the independence of G, um, general, general continuum hypothesis in the development of set theoretical axiomatics. The implication here is that the grounding of the theory of the subject on the gap between standard constructible sets and generic sets forced by countable, countable chains of conditions is in danger of losing a certain degree of necessity that it might have once possessed. The problem concerning the question of where inconsistent multiplicity is lo localized, the power of generic sets is granted by the unique surrogate played, played by the continuum. So when we undo the requirement for the relation between generic sets and standard ZFC, the subject is once again lost against the backdrop of a philosophical dialectic of the infinite. So you, you lose some of the mathematical tools that être événement used to define the subject. So one possible situation is to follow, as Luca Fraser indicated years ago, an intuitionistic understanding of the forcing procedure. So its implications are more closely matched non-classical and anti-transfinitist roots. Now, I don't want to go down this road, but it is a possible solution. So it just opens up the, the, a vision of the kind of danger that this kind of problems can pose for being an event project. So second implication, synthesis and subtraction. So within the context of Cahier pour l'analyse, Badiou advocated a subtractive outlook in the program of mathematics. And this is the one, this is the thing that really attracts me to, to his work, right? The full program was never realized, but some of this outlook stands at the basis of the project of mathematical ontology in Lettre Venement. The larger outlook posited by the rejection of genuine entities standing at the basis of mathematical speculation. Famously, the subtractive approach polarized the mathematical fields in uh, la subversion infinitesimale uh, between the revolutionary uh, paths and the subjugated ones, right? So, set theory versus geometry, right? Geometry is this subjugated one. Um, but this, this was, you know, uh, 1969. Um, in Lettre in Venement, Badiou lays out four general approaches to mathematical ontology. The final one, the transversal approach, is meant to cut through the first three approaches. So the first three approaches includes, you know, intuitionism, uh, constructi constructivism, things like that. The, 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 the fourth approach is supposed to cut through all of them transversally. However, this transversally can be transversality can be understood in a synthetic way. This synthesis is from the perspective of etre damaging, I, I claim, to the exposition of the subject. 
Again here, the problem is to supplant an ontology with like, some kind of epistemology, such that the distinction between presentation, representation on the one hand, and constructible and inconstructible are met with a pluralistic acceptance, right? Hence, we encounter a dialectic that stands autonomously over mathematical developments. So that's in the final account, it is the philosophical subject that decides what methods count and which methods don't count. So this is perhaps the very role of an ambiguous infinite resisting ontological reason and continue, con continues to loom over the project as such. And I've just mentioned that, I mean, th th in this sense, it, this project plays a very interesting uh, role in dialogue with uh, Fernando Zalamea's uh, synthetic approach, right? Because I, I think even though I think Zalame Professor Zalamea wants to draw close to some elements of being an event, I really see these two as kind of incompatible type of approaches to mathematics and its relation to the infinite and to the mathematic, uh, to, to, to ontology. But uh, I mean, those are all, I think, uh, productive regions for explore, further exploration. So with that, I, I thank you very much. <laughs> right, thank you.